Okay. All right. So, if I can have your attention, please. Uh, thank you all for coming back on time from break. This is awesome. Uh, so, welcome to the um, final speaker in the Brown Bag series for this uh, calendar year. We'll have more uh, after the break. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Rob Lindgren, who is an associate professor at uh, University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Um, he has his PhD in the learning sciences from Stanford and uh, is uh, among many accomplishments as a recipient of the Jan Hawkins Award for Early Career Humanistic Contributions to Technology, uh, an award they only give to the very best of people. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> uh, and uh, so, you know, Rob, so Rob's work uh, broadly looks at uh, emerging and new technologies like simulations, augmented reality, uh, embodied technologies, which we'll hear about today. Um, and so I've been uh, aware of Rob's work about it for over a decade now. <laughs> We've known each other a long time. Uh, and one of the things I, I've always enjoyed about his work is how he uh, builds on and extends laboratory experiments and also goes into classrooms and works with real kids and, and really builds on what kids actually do uh, and the, the kinds of things they, they do naturally and spontaneously in, in also theorizing and then bringing that back into uh, more structured laboratory context. I think there's some really nice bridging and, and carry across that I've always appreciated. And, uh, and that I'll just leave it to Rob to tell us all about cool embodied stuff. Is that a good start? Yes, yeah, <laughs> cool, cool embodied you. stuff. I was actually hoping that Joshua would teach me the Jan Hawkins handshake. <laughs> I hear there's, there's one of those. Well, so thank you all for uh, being here. I, I was half expecting it to be, you know, like four or five people and then, you know, <laughs> Thanksgiving leftovers, you know, for my, uh, uh, for my meal. But, uh, uh, but yeah, you're, I'm going to assume this means that you're all energized and excited, uh, excited to be here. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm Rob Lindgren. I'm from you know the University of Illinois. Let me just quickly sort of step through the uh, the different hats that that I wear. Um, I'm an associate professor in the College of Education. I'm actually in the curriculum and instruction uh, department there. We don't have a formal learning sciences uh, group um, uh, or a department at uh, U of I. Um, uh, but we've got several uh, people, several faculty members there who do identify uh, as such. Um, and so we've got a nice nice community there. My own lab is the Embodied and Immersive Technologies Lab, uh, the, the Emit Lab, that's where I have my students. And I'm, I'm also wearing a new, um, uh, a new hat these days, not this one, but... Uh, uh, metaphorical hat, um, uh, which is that I'm heading up a, a new institute, and institute is, is a strong word, a new initiative at the <coughs> University of Illinois called TIRAD, and TIRAD stands for uh, Technology Innovations in Educational Research and Design. And I, I think the best way I can describe that here in this place is it's sort of the poor man's version of, you know, the, the CR uh, TL that, uh, that you have, and that we're, we're aspirational to get to the point of having a center um, uh, to be able to um, uh, bring people all across campus to do good work on learning and learning technologies. Um, uh, but we're still kind of in the ground level stages of trying to get people excited about um, uh, excited about doing uh, doing those things. So um, uh, let, let me just dive right into it because uh, you know I titled this talk "Design Considerations for Embodied Learning." And I think that, that this requires a little bit of unpacking, and and because it's probably a term that maybe some of you have started to hear, um, uh, maybe maybe some of you you know have uh, uh, have not, maybe some of you think of yourselves as as doing work in the embodied learning space, but it's a word that that truthfully does kind of trip people up sometimes, and and I know even in my own paper reviewing, I can get a little bit is this actually embodied learning, mm -hmm. um, and, and so you know it's it's worth talking about it a little bit, so. so so first, you know, at the at the at the level of probably accurate but generally unhelpful is to say this: applications of theories of embodied uh, cognition to the design of learning environments, and 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 that is true because uh, for the most part, people who are thinking about embodied learning are trying to use you know all the wonderful you know theorization that's happening um, in psychology, in philosophy of mind. 
uh, to think about the embodied nature um, of thinking and applying it uh, to create better educational spaces um, uh, for uh, learners across uh, the lifespan. But the important thing to note is that uh, you know the, the just the term embodied cognition is by no means uh, you know an agreed upon term. There are uh, you know a number of different variations of that theory. Um, uh, you know, Margaret Wilson wrote this seminal paper in 2002, Six Views of Embodied Cognition. Well, if I was to guess at this point, it's probably expanded to more like 12 views of embodied cognition. There's a lot of spirited debate going uh, on um, in terms of thinking about what embodied cognition is. And, then, and I'm thankful that there is, you know, that, uh, that work being done in psychology um, You've got great researchers here like Dr. Goldstone who are thinking about the, the mechanisms in which um, uh, in the mechanisms in, in which the cognition is embodied. Um, uh, I think you know probably what these these ideas of embodied cognition share is the basic tenet that processes of thinking um, are inseparable from our systems of uh, perception and action. Now, if you are a uh, you know a perceptual psychologist or a cognitive psychologist or even a theory of mind philosopher, this is going to be probably a fairly deeply unsatisfying <laughs> statement, right? Because it does it lacks that sort of mechanistic specificity. It doesn't tell you exactly how these things are are embodied, and 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 that's. Uh, and and that's fine, and, and I, I want to know the answers to those mechanistic questions, and I think that it's good that people are, are doing that work. But I do want to say, as, a, as an educational researcher, as somebody who is, sits in a curriculum and instruction department, I can get a lot of mileage out of just this statement, this, I, this premise, this, this assumption that how uh, uh, you know how our processes of thinking are connected to our processes of movement and 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 our, our our physical activity. And the reason why I can get that mileage is because we we are dealing with you know decades upon decades of curriculum and and pedagogy that is clearly not working with this basic assumption, right? So I can I can propose just using this basic idea that there is that connection. Propose new interventions. New uh, new technologies that 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 work with that assumption and and test their efficacy in educational uh, uh, settings and so that really is kind of where I am in terms of my research agenda is that if we if we sort of embrace that central tenet of embodied cognition uh, that that idea that there is that connection there are a lot of uh, immediately a lot of really interesting and, and compelling implications that could potentially be designed uh, into an educational intervention, but for the most part, in, in a lot of cases, have not, right? So, um, you know, just to, look, to rattle off a few of those things, the idea that expanding one's repertoire of movements and physical activities has the potential to expand their thinking. So just getting students to move in new and creative ways, prompting them to, to do physical actions that could potentially serve as metaphors is, is one possibility if you take that assumption. A second is that learning interventions need to consider the type and the quality of interactions that students have with the physical environment. I think I and probably many of you here are getting a little tired of hearing just sort of like, oh, it's good because it's hands-on learning, right? And, you know, it's concrete learning. Like you're using, you're, you know, you're having people move stuff or do stuff or take, take actions. But what, you know, if, if you take embodied cognition seriously, embodied learning seriously, it really suggests you need to be thinking deeply about the quality of those interactions. It's not just that any movement, that any action is going to lead to new learning. It's, it's, it's the way that that action has been elicited, the way that it has been designed, and the way that it connects to the content that you want uh, people, to, uh, people to understand. And then the third is that, um, uh, you know, a powerful possibility can build ideas um, and intuitions around formal concepts through analogies and metaphors. And, and probably most importantly is providing opportunities for reflection on, on those metaphors. And that's where technology in particular comes in handy because you can take these otherwise ephemeral 
uh, actions uh, that people do, the gestures that, that they make when they talk and then immediately disappear, and you can preserve them and you can, you can uh, allow for opportunities for people to reflect on those embodied, on those embodied actions in ways that we weren't uh, able to do so before. So if I was able to sort of sum it up, you know, I would sort of describe it as activity that affords reflection on the connections between the movements and the actions of the body and target ideas in STEM for me, because that's where I, I, I mostly focus, uh, but, but other domains as well. Now obviously that is quite broad, right? I mean, there are a lot of things that could potentially fall underneath that heading of embodied learning, and I think that there are a lot of things that fall underneath that heading, even within the space of technology-enhanced learning environments. So you've got a couple of my environments up here where you've got kids doing hand gestures, you've got kids moving their full bodies around to learn science, science concepts, but you've also got the potential to use you know, uh, body uh, sensing devices, Fitbits, and, and, and uh, other physiological trackers, getting people to collect that data, to reflect on that data because it's their data, it's personal data that they've collected from their bodies. Um, you've got even just working with avatars and, and all the sort of the intuitions that come with working with a, uh, working in an environment uh, where you've got a character that is, uh, that is human-like and so you have human-like responses to them. Um, this is uh, uh, an environment here from my colleague, uh, Mina johnson Glenberg who does um, really cool, you know, connect-based games where she has uh, students sort of acting out their ideas about things like, like levers, and again, giving them opportunities to reflect on whether or not they're making, you know, productive representations of the ideas that people are trying to understand. And to some extent, even just, you know, doing tangible things, you know, ta you know tangible computing, moving things around and having that sort of physical feel would also, I think, fall under the, the auspices of, of embodied learning. Embodied learning, and I, uh, you know, I. But to be clear, you know, my work tends to focus more on these inactive environments, these environments where kids could sort of act out either with their hands or with their bodies what their ideas are, and then get uh, get feedback and allow and allow reflection on those ideas. And so, you know, I've always come to this idea of uh, this this area of embodied learning, you know, thinking about it as a big tent, right? I want it to be inclusive. I don't want to be the gatekeeper in terms of things that I would, you know, in terms of saying like, no, 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 you're not embodied learning. But, you know, now I'm tenured and, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm more and more getting these papers and I'm, I'm uh, you know, that I'm, I'm supposed to be reviewing and, and listening to these, you know, descriptions of, of you know, what presumably is, is embodied learning and thinking, you know, no, that doesn't quite meet the, the threshold. So I think it is worth talking about some things that, that, you know, maybe are not embodied learning. And I think for me, at least the big distinction is whether, you know, well, well, first of all, is there a relationship between the activity and the, uh, the content, the ideas, the discourse, whatever it is that is the target of the educational intervention? And, and surprisingly, in a lot of cases, it isn't, right? So a lot of times, I mean, this is obviously a silly example, you know, kids just sort of running around in a room. Um, but, you know, th to be fair, there are some folks uh, that, that believe that just sort of general, you know, physical movement uh, uh, in, in a classroom or some other type of educational environment is going to naturally uh, uh, produce, uh, produce learning. There isn't any evidence uh, to support that, uh, that being the case. Um, but, uh, um, but there are starting to be, you know, more sophisticated uh, implementations of uh, these, these kinds of things. And this is one, this is a little bit older of an example, but it's, it's one of my favorites um, because it, uh, um, yeah, because it, I, I think it nicely captures, and it's from the commercial sector, so I don't have to feel like I'm probably insulting anybody in this room. <laughs> um, uh, here's just a, a quick clip. No. Okay, maybe not, but that's okay. I can actually describe it pretty well. It's it's, it's pretty self-explanatory. So it's it's, uh, it's a connect-based game. 
Um, it's actually a suite of games. It's got a number of different um, uh, uh, sort of topics. There's math. Um, uh, there's some uh, literacy skills that are, are taught within here. And it's a game, um, two players. You can see here you've got two players uh, playing this. And, um, and here is a, is a screenshot, a pretty telling screenshot, where they are, it's a soccer themed game where they are answering um, arithmetic questions. Um, I don't know why they picked this as an example, but this question happens to be, what is 200,000 plus 523,156? And uh, they are indicating which of these five answers is correct by using um, kicking motions, because the Kinect will read their kicking motions. So what do we think about this as an example of embodied learning? <laughs> is there a connection between the physical actions that we're asking the students to do and what it is that they're learning? No. no right? I mean, this is answering multiple choice questions with your feet. And, 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 and you know, I, I would honestly like to say that this is... Uh, an anomaly that that oh you know this was just a, a, a you know a, a poorly informed you know design team the thought that they get something out to the market quickly but I've read research papers that are about testing the efficacy of exactly these kinds of uh, of environments and so you know I think I think we have to be really clear when we're talking about embodied learning you know I, I again I, I'm not don't want to be the gatekeeper but there needs to be some sort of uh, uh, you know, semblance of, of meaning in the, in the space between the actions that we're asking students, uh, learners, uh, to take and the content that we want them to learn. Because if we can't identify what that connection is, why would we expect them to identify that connection? And all of a sudden this just becomes the buttons that one pushes in order to get the answer and make everybody happy. The, the particularly depressing thing about this for me is that they were actually taking this around to classrooms. So this is actually a shot of two students using this game, and everybody else, you can't see them, is sort of circled around them watching them do this. So they're essentially watching them answer multiple choice questions with their feet. Um, let's see if this one goes. This is a new one. You know, God bless undergraduate students. Um, uh, they, they actually um, uh, uh, brought this to me. They wanted to do a presentation on this one, but... I have a feeling this isn't going to go up either, um, which is fine. I should probably skip over it, but it's uh, it's called Number Hunt. It's a VR um, uh, game, um, and so you know, embodied, right? Because you're in VR <laughs> using the Oculus, and uh, yeah, you are literally. I mean, this is this is um, uh, you know, full on you know, great graphics, uh, and you are shooting these numbers with legs, and and I honestly. <laughs> I honestly couldn't, I don't think I could tell you what exactly um, uh, the, the operations were. I think you get like little operators that come on the gun and then you can do things to these numbers based on the things that, that, that you shoot on them. Market it as an educational game, you can buy it now. I think it's like $12 or so uh, to buy it, so it's actually on the market. Um, uh, yeah, these things exist. And so, you know, we, we, I think, you know, in order for, this, you know, embodied learning not to become satire, not to become, you know, the things that people joke about, about these, you know, new way, way of things uh, that people are doing in education. We need to be clear about what the actual affordances of this approach to designing educational environments um, uh, actually is. And so, you know, the, I think the question to ask at this point then is, you know, what, so, okay, so we've got this field of embodied learning, it's a little new, it's a little fuzzy, um, what do we actually need here? I mean, what, what, what is it that we, you know, would help this, this field going forward? And, and from my perspective, you know, I, I feel like I need more good examples. I need more people doing, you know, the kind of work that Joshua and other people are doing that are actually doing the hard work of finding, you know, the, finding those connections, those important connections uh, between the movement and the, the content that, that, that generates the, the insights and the understandings that, that we want people to see. And I think some of that, you know, good examples, but I think you can also give it at a more abstract level some design guidance. And so the rest of this talk um, is really going to be about me kind of talking about um, you know, the, the lessons that I've learned through the research that I've done uh, on embodied learning and things that I would like to see you know, other people uptake or even you know, uh, happen in my own work uh, going forward. I did want to want to suggest this. You know, I've been thinking, I've been reflecting a lot because we are in this kind of early stage 
of, of, of embodied learning, um, of you know, what sort of parallels are there out there. And I, I, I think a lot about game-based learning. And you know, so game-based learning is probably 10, 15 years ahead of where I think embodied learning is now. And I think there's a lot of, you know, I think there's a lot of good and I think there's some bad to be learned about, you know, so what, what sort of happened with game-based learning. And so I think you'll see throughout some of my, 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 you know, my tips, my design guidance, that I'm really looking for ways to kind of avoid some of the pitfalls that we've sort of seen with, with game-based uh, learning in terms of how it's been implemented and how it's even been, been uh, talked about in the, in the literature. Because obviously, I mean, game-based learning is big. It's, as an effect, there's still you know, many of us who feel very passionately, very strongly that games can be a good way to, uh, uh, to, to learn, in, in, learn in all the right ways that people should be learning. Um, but uh, there's also, you know, so many examples of it being implemented in, in ways that um, that don't fulfill those goals. And so we don't we don't want that to happen with embodied learning. So um, so here's some some things. And and as I talk about these um, these principles, I'm going to weave in some results and some uh, discussion of the the work that I've done. So I'm going to basically talk about a project, and then I'm going to talk about a few principles that came from uh, that project. So this first project is called Grass. Gesture Augmented Simulations for Supporting Explanations. Creative acronyming uh, there. Um, <laughs> not the craziest acronym you will see in this talk. Um, uh, so the, the idea with this project was to, um, to create simulations that could work with <coughs> students as they were creating, um, as they were creating explanations um, about science phenomena. Here we go. So there's no sound here. I'm going to talk over this. This is just going to kind of give you an overview of what these simulations look like. Essentially, we picked these three phenomena. We picked uh, heat transfer. This is gas pressure. Um, uh, basically, what you know, what happens inside of a, 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 a plastic syringe when you push the plunger down. So they're sort of acting that out. And then the causes of seasons is the third area. And we build these simulations using the leap motion device, which detects you know basically where uh, students' hands are, right above the laptop computer. We use these kinds of prompts to get them to do particular types of gestures. And then, uh, and then you may have seen it quickly, but the hands will then disappear, and then they're sort of left to control these simulations just using their hands, like the student is here. They're actually moving the location of the Earth relative to the angle of the light rays that are hitting on the surface of the Earth. This is um, students learning about heat transfer by bumping their hands together and observing basically the chain reaction in the molecules um, as they move from uh, one section of the metal to another section of the metal. So that's a very quick, uh, fast and furious overview of the project. Um, you know, we, we're, we're kind of in the end stages of that project now. We've written um, a bunch of papers, we've done a bunch of studies, both in the laboratory context and the classroom context. And, uh, um, and so what are some of the things that we've learned? So, Joshua previewed this first point very nicely um, for me already, and you know I've come to believe <laughs> through the work that I've done that that you know embodied learning design should really aim beyond simple concepts and 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 simple you know facts and 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 focus more on practices, right? And and so uh, and and you know this is consistent with the the education reform efforts that are out there, right? So the NGSS is a good example. They they're actually explicit about there being well, you know, there's these I think eight practices that we want students to uh, become comfortable with as they're learning um, about uh, about science. And I think. Uh, you know, em embodiment and embodied interventions can play a role with this. I think for, you know, for maybe the most obvious reason is that I think people already recognize practices as being embodied. So unlike concepts, which are these sort of like abstract, you know, ideas out there. Now, I would actually argue that those are also embodied, but for now. Uh, uh, but practices um, are, you know, we already sort of see them, you know, they're asking questions, they're doing an investigation, they're, they're creating a model. These are things that we think of as being agentic. They're things that people do. And so we can, um, we can imagine sort of integrating um, uh, embodied acts and prompts to, to do embodied acts in order to, to facilitate people to do uh, a, a more productive, job of, of engaging with these, uh, with these practices. And I, I, 
the, the third reason is that, you know, I think focusing on practices, and, and you know, there, because there's, there's already <laughs> been a number of demonstrations in the embodied learning literature, embodied cognition literature that shows, yeah, if you do, if you have students do like this motion, it gets them to understand this concept really well. And I mean, I've done some of that research, right? I mean, and, and, and that's good. I think, I think it's good to know that. But focusing on, uh, you know, focusing on practices, I think, challenges the designer and their approach. And it encourages, and it really kind of changes your mindset. It certainly changed our mindset on the grasp that, you know, we're not just trying to get them to, um, to be able to tell us in two sentences what the causes of seasons are or what is, you know, thermal conduction, uh, but to be able to engage in a productive way with other students, with a teacher, whoever it is, about or, or a simulation about that topic um, to, to use their bodies, you know, through gestures and, and other ways um, to build a shared and collective understanding of this through, through practices. Now, the specific practice that we focused on in GRASP was constructing explanations. Um, you know, it's seen uh, as a very important part of uh, the Next Generation Science Standards, um, you know, something that, that researchers have, have uh, uh, you know, recognized for a very long time as being, you know, an important thing to, to developing science knowledge. You know, particularly within science, you've got all these different things. You've got, you know, the particles in the air. You've got magnetic fields. They're things that you can't see, right? And this seems like a really ripe opportunity for embodied learning, right? Because I can not only, you know, not just show them a picture of these things, but I can actually make these things visible in a way that's personal to students by having them represent it with their bodies, with their hands, you know, to, and, and even if they're not, if they're not acting out the canonical, you know, definition or the canonical model for a particular process, it's at least something now that they can work with, that they can iterate on, something that they can get feedback on, as opposed to look at this picture and try to make sense of this visual and extremely com complicated phenomenon, right? At least now we're, we're, we're engaging them more in, in doing this. And, you know, we've, we've assessed, and uh, this is, you know, some of the work from my student Rob Wallen, we've assessed, you know, how good these interventions are at developing explanations in a number uh, of different ways. This is just like a, a small study he did with students, middle school students, um, where just looking at basically the progress of their explanations from when we asked them at the very beginning, what is the causes of seasons, to, um, uh, to the, excuse me, not the speaker whose phone goes off, um, <laughs> to uh, the end where they're again asked what is uh, the causes um, of seasons. And even in that fairly coarse sort of approach to assessing explanations, we do find I improvements. I won't go into the coding scheme, but basically these are sort of less canonical to more canonical views of, of seasons. And you can see that, that in the final explanations, uh, students were more and more adopting the more canonical views of seasons. So that's good. But, you know, when we started looking at the actual examples of students constructing explanations with these tools, we actually found that it was, it was a lot more interesting to look at what was happening as they were sort of developing this ability, as they were working with this tool. So this is just one um, example I want to show. This is um, Dontrell. Um, uh, who is a middle school student, although you would be surprised by uh, his voice. Um, uh, and he is, this is actually him being asked um, uh, about gas pressure. So this is a situation where you've got a, a, a plastic syringe, it's closed at the top, you ask the student to push, uh, the, push it in as far as it can go. Um, at first they may predict that it won't go in at all, um, but it does go in, it goes in most of the way, but not all the way, and then when you let go, it pops back out again. And that's the key phenomenon that we're, we're, we're trying to ask them about is why. Why does it do that? Why does it go back to where it was? What, what is sort of pushing it back out? And so this is, this is the question that, that uh, Darnell is trying to answer. So why do you think it gets harder and harder as you push it in, and then why do you think it pops back out and let go? Because the air has like no way of escaping to like release the pressure that's being put on it, and okay. then when you let it go, it um it like pushes it back out, so it has more room. Okay, what's pushing it back into that? The air. The air. Yeah. And then I want to show this part because this is where 
you know, throughout the, these interviews, we realized it was important to actually get them to reflect on, okay, you're doing these, these gestures, you're using their hands, but do you actually know what your hands represent, right? So that th this first explanation was was fine, but it, it, it wasn't really mechanistic, right? He wasn't, he was just saying, well, you know, the, the air basically wants to get out, which is not a scientific explanation. Um, uh, but he, you know, he, he, he seemed, he was very engaged, he seemed ready to sort of um, uh, talk about the molecular ideas. And so we present him with this simulation where he, um, he has to make these associations. So here's just... So what's your problem with this process? The um the the, the molecules in the um the nozzle I think it's called no it's called the yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, so he's been using it for a little bit. He's got a good sort of idea of what his hands represent <laughs> um, uh, as he's using the simulation, and now this is where he starts to. So what's your problem here? Um, uh, to, to make these connections and turn it into an explanation. Because the molecules are hitting against it more often. Okay. While it's pushing against it. Uh -huh. I'll make the pressure go low. Why is the pressure low when you don't hit it very fast? Because the molecules are more spread out and they don't they can't hit it as often. Okay. Okay. How did you make? How did you make sense of the fact that you know when you hit, when you're hitting fast, um, you know the, the, this thing is moving over like this. By the way, the um, well, really by the way, the how, really by the way, how as I was hitting faster, the pressure bar was building up faster, uh -huh. and if I started hitting slower, it would start going down. Okay. And then like while I'm doing that, the puncher starts, the puncher starts like moving, going back and forth, uh -huh. depending on how fast I hit. Okay. Um, uh, so when you were doing this, how were you thinking of, the, of your, your action? The faster I hit, the, um, the more the pressure will build up. Okay. So it's kind of fascinating to watch this, right? Because he's going from this fairly sort of like, you know, high level, the air wants to get out, you know, there's air in there and it, it's, it's stuck and it wants to get out, to, you know, to, to building this much more nuanced sort of description. And finally he gets to this point where he says, you know, the faster I hit, which he's, he said is basically representing the molecules hitting the, the plunger, the faster I, I hit, um, the more pressure that builds up, and that's what's what's pushing it out. And that's the key, right? It's the it's the frequency with which the molecules inside the gas molecules inside that enclosed space are hitting the sides that that causes that that pressure, right? And so we've sort of watched him go you know, through the process of using this um, uh, this tool to develop that more, to scaffold that more sophisticated explanation. And you know, we've, we've been playing around with a number of different ways to sort of represent this sort of journey um, using these tools. Um, uh, Natasha Mathias is another student um, uh, who's worked uh, on this project and she's created a number of really, I think, clever um, visualizations that sort of show uh, the progress of students' explanations as they encounter sort of different phases of the interview, recognizing that it's not just the tool, it's not just, you know, having them do the gesture and looking at the simulation, but it's sort of the whole sequence of events that happen in the course of these interviews um, that, that develop over time you know, these different components. And so by, by visualizing it this way, we can get a sense of well, what are the different components and how are they contributing to um, this overall capacity for, uh, for developing an explanation. So the second, the second lesson that comes from, uh, from this is, is a little bit of a caveat on the first one, which is that even though it is the case we should be focusing on practices, it doesn't, it doesn't to me at least mean that we should be ignoring completely the idea of, of concepts. And so I, you know, I've argued for a long time that it's important to develop embodied learning environments that encourage students to make movements, to do gestures that are aligned in some way with the concept or the idea that you want, uh, you want them to learn. And you know, that, that, that argument has uh, you know, you know, played out in sort of mixed ways over, over the years. Right? I've gotten a fair amount of pushback about, about that, that. 
And I think one of the and, and I think some of that feed, that pushback is good and healthy. You know, I think one of the assumptions when you say something like that is that oh, there must only be sort of one way that somebody can represent um, uh, that can represent an idea. And there, and truthfully, there is some literature out there that does sort of suggest that you know, kind of a, a, a reductionist view that that you know. Certain ideas have very specific movements that have to be made in order for people to, to understand uh, those things. And I don't think that that's, that's actually the case at all. What I think is actually more important is that there's opportunities for students to express and to, uh, to be encouraged to have something I've been sort of referring to as semantic intent. That they have this opportunity to, to sort of um, Make a representation that they that they at least believe represents something, right? And that's and so I'm going to digress here for a second because I think I think this is really important. So you know the idea that um, that there's one gesture that could potentially go with any sort of learning contact, I think is challenged by the fact that we experience people doing gestures, making actions all the time um, that that they believe mean certain things that nobody questions those things because there is that sort of presence of gestural intent. So let's say for example that I'm <laughs> describing to you all my drive here from Champaign-Urbana uh, to Bloomington uh, last night. This actually happened by the way. So I'm driving along and it's dark and it's rainy and uh, all of a sudden the truck in front of me, the, the, there's these big wooden pallets slid off the truck probably only a few, you know, a hundred or so yards uh, ahead of me. Pallet slid off the truck, I turned the car, and all of a sudden the car was sort of slipping around, slipping around, but I regained control, and I was able to get back on my way, and I made it to Bloomington safely. Okay? All right, so if I did that, thank you. So if I, if I told that story, you know, maybe I'm in a bar because it's pretty animated, but if I told that, if I told that story to you, I don't think anybody would be like, what is he doing? Like, what, what is he doing with his hands, right? But let's think about one of those gestures that I made for a second, right? So I'm, I am, you know, I talk about how I'm slip sliding off the side of the road, making that kind of gesture. Well, what is this exactly, right? I mean, it's not really showing, it's certainly not showing like how I was controlling the steering wheel, because if I did that, I'd be in a lot more trouble than I was. <laughs> it's also, I mean, you know, it's not really showing, I mean, maybe it's showing slipping, maybe it's showing, you know, sort of the rotation of the tires. It's not really, you know, commensurate or congruent with the, 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 con you know, the idea, the concept that I'm trying to convey. But at the same time, like, nobody questions that. Like, it seems like a reasonable, a reasonable expression of, of an idea. And, and I think that that's really central here, is that, that we are creating these spaces, and, and, and I'll talk about this in the next project, that we're creating spaces where students can, can act out uh, semantic intent, that they can show intent with the, their gestures and that there can be a mapping between what it is that they intend um, and, the, and the gestures that they're making. Um, in the context of grasp, so digression over, in the, in the context of grasp, I think a really good example of this is in seasons, right? So we ask students basically what causes the seasons. We ask why is it cold in the winter and why is it warm uh, in the summer? And um, and inevitably, you know, there's a middle school audience, they usually uh, blurt, if, if they don't really know the answer, they usually blurt out one fact right away, and they kind of think that they're done. What is that, what is that fact? 23.5 degrees. Yes, that the earth is, <laughs> yes, that the earth is tilted. And sometimes they do know exactly what the tilt is, but that's kind of, kind of all it is that they know. Now, if you ask them, it, it's funny because there's a similar thing that happens with gesturing. So if you ask them, well, can you sort of, you know, use your hands and show me why we, why we have seasons, they'll often immediately kind of do this, right, because they're approximating the, the tilt of the earth. But then you start probing them a little bit on this and you say, well, you know, so show me then using, you know, using this or, or however you want to show me um, uh, why we have, you know, warm summers and cold winters. And they'll, they'll usually, they'll hold their hand up like this and they'll usually say, well, you know, the sun comes in up top here, and, and this is where it's summer, and then it comes in down here, and this is where it's winter. See where I'm going with this? Like, what's, what's the problem with this? <coughs> right? This versus this? What's, what's, the, what's the perceptible difference between this versus this when I make that representation? Mm -hmm. 
It's the distance, right? So the, so, so the, the only dif difference, the angle is not any different that I'm hitting the surface, but the distance is different. And that leads to the idea that the reason we have warm summers and cold winters is because of the relative distance between the Earth and the sun, which is not the case, right? And so what we try to do in GRASP is not, you know, not to, to blow that up or make fun of them for having an idea, but it's, it's instead to get them to use a gestural framing that is more productive in thinking about the actual mechanism, um, which in this case is the angle with which the rays hit the surface of the Earth. So instead of thinking about it as like this abstract axis that's tilted, think about what's happening on the ground. What is the angle of the rays that are coming in the ground? And so what you can see here is this um, student using her hand to basically control this view, which is the angle with which the light rays are hitting the ground. And she can actually control, as we saw earlier in the video, the position of the Earth relative to the sun just by changing the angle with which those light rays. And all of a sudden, you get them using those kinds of gestures, even though those weren't the gestures that they maybe would have thought of uh, to, to create, puts them in this framing where they can come up with these, they're engaging with the mechanistic process. They, they're engaging with the causal mechanism of seasons, and they do better in terms of talking about it. So let's skip this. So the, the third lesson, and hopefully this came through with my uh, uh, with with you know the previous example that that queuing is good it can be really helpful not not just to get people to be robots and to perform exactly the kinds of gestures that we want them to, to create but we want them to uh, to be able to be in that frame of gesturing in ways that are going to be productive that other students can sort of build on those so it's a good idea to uh, to queue. The question for me is, is more, how do you cue? How do you get somebody to you know, do a, what we might consider to be a productive type of gesture? And the cool thing is, is that we're, we're kind of entering in this space where we've got a lot of possibilities, a lot of options for this. The, the mixed reality, the augmented reality, the haptic tools that we have are, can be very, very good at sort of nudging people to do particular types of actions. Um, and so we just need to think about what are the right ways to administer those things. So I like this example. Uh, Victor Lee sent this to me a number of years ago. Um, uh, I like this example because it is kind of ridiculous and extreme. Um, uh, you know, this idea that you could just put a device on your hand and it would teach you how to draw. Um, I think we all know that, that it <laughs> probably wouldn't play out exactly that way or you'd have such a, such a limited you know, sort of skill set in this space that it wouldn't, it wouldn't be useful. But it does kind of, I think to me, suggest sort of where we're going and what sort of the potentials are. That we do have the, the opportunity now to, you know, to nudge people in ways that might be productive. Not just for performing, you know, sort of rote physical tasks, but for putting them in a mindset to be able to think about uh, think about phenomenon, to think about models differently than they had before. I'm going to skip this too. And now I'm going to talk about my second big project, which is elastics. So, um, elastics. Embodied learning augmented through simulation theaters for interacting with cross cutting concepts in science. <laughs> I was expecting a little bit more. <laughs> yes. So this project um, uh, is also looking at embodied learning. It's also looking at sort of big ideas. Um, this is more focused on uh, high school and an undergraduate audience. Um, the idea is that we're creating these theaters. Um, so not just hand gestures, but actually full body environments. I will say I'm a little disappointed the student wasn't super enthusiastic with the body movements, so it looks a little bit rote. But, uh, um, but this is essentially how it works. They, the, the student comes in, they define a gesture for a particular kind of uh, operation. In this case, um, uh, successive multiplication um, and addition to learn about um, uh, exponential scales. And the, the focus of this project was really to think, can we, can we start 
to think of embodied learning not just as teaching you know, one topic in one area, but to actually build capacities for people to be able to transfer these ideas across domains. And so the Next Generation Science Standards cross-cutting concept seemed like a really fertile place to try this, right? They've outlined these seven cross-cutting ideas that appear in all these different domains, but the, you know, the curriculum that, that is out there doesn't, in most cases, you know, tell teachers, tell designers how to actually forge those connections. And so with Elastics, we are trying to, to attempt to forge uh, some, of those, some of those connections. Um, and, and we did this, we did this on the uh, GRASS project as well. You know, we didn't know how students were going to be thinking about things. I mean, this is an example of looking at how students just uh, would use a gestural representation of doubling, right? And we saw a lot of different things. We saw a lot of different gestures. Uh, so this student was actually doing sort of a stacking type of gesture, right? They said, well, you can kind of think of stacking as like of something and then stacking it on top of on top of it. This student, on the other hand, used a very symbolic, you know, kind of two type gestures. And what we found is that when we actually engage them in thinking about problems that use the concept of doubling, students who had the more concrete gestures tended to do to do better because they weren't just thinking about it in terms of well, yeah, you know, it's just times two, which is what we we saw quite a bit in these in these interviews. So those kinds of interviews gave us ideas for things that we could potentially you know, uh, build into these systems um, opportunities for students to sort of have more concrete representations <coughs> of these relatively abstract ideas and, uh, um, and do good things. So my fourth lesson is don't throw in the towel on learning transfer which is uh, something, you know, I, I, I feel like I see a lot that, that uh, you know, well, we just, we've got to get them to understand, you know, this concept. We've got to show that embodied learning can help them here. Um, but really, the, the holy grail still needs to be getting them to take what it is that they've learned and apply it to a new space. And so that's, that's what Elastics is trying to do. So I'm, I'm going to talk through one study in a bit more detail than I have so far because I think it's, it's important for making... <coughs> this point and showing the possibilities in terms of, of transfer. So these are um, uh, two of the Elastics environments. This one uh, is looking at earthquakes. This one is looking at acids and bases. And uh, as you may know, um, both of these you know, domains use a scale, a logarithmic scale. Um, uh, in earthquakes, and so we can, we can structure the way that we talk about the content in these domains. We can still cover, you know, what is a you know, P wave versus an S wave in, uh, in the earthquake simulation. But the key interactions with, with both of these simulations is to look at an earthquake that is 7.0. You would use gestures to get that earthquake built up to a 7.0 and then you would trigger it and you see the earthquake in the same way that if you wanted to bring your solution to a, you know, a pH of four, you would do that and then you would see what that looks like in a pond ecosystem environment. So here's just sort of what those look like. This is what the um, student sees on the screen. So they do gestures, they're building up. There. I'll just go ahead and start this one so you can see analogous. Building up adding information to make it um, more basic, I believe. And then, so this student's going to trigger this earthquake. See the fault move, the waves go out, and then you get to see the effects of this particular earthquake on this on this town. So the key thing is is that a student is interacting with these simulations, and, and if they do, if they're in the condition in our study where they did both of these embodied simulations, they use the same gestures to do these mathematical operations in both cases, right? And so the the design of this study looks like this. So basically, we have these three different conditions. We have um, uh, three groups come in, 
and um, one of those groups does uh, the embodied earthquake simulation. Two of the other groups do traditional instructions, sort of watching videos, readings from some textbook um, uh, excerpts. You could argue, and we have argued, that, that there's actually more content in the traditional instruction than there is in the simulation environment. And then the second session, a couple weeks later, the group that had used the simulation before is going to use uh, the simulation again for to learn about acids and bases. Um, one of the groups that did traditional instruction before um, is going to still do tr traditional instruction. So we've got one sort of clean control group all the way through. Um, but then the other one is going to learn about acids and bases in the second section. And so here is kind of our, our big finding in a nice black and white graph. Um, uh, so this is the, the sim sim group. Uh, the dark line here. So this is the group that learned, this is their score in the pretest for earthquakes, post-test for earthquakes, pretest for acids and bases, post-test for acids and bases, right? And so you can see the simulation had a big effect for the, um, uh, for the simulation group. So this was the only group that used um, the embodied simulation and the, and the important thing is that they retained that effect, right? So you give them the pretest on acids and bases, and they are far above the others, even though this is the first time that they've encountered the simulation just like these two other groups. This dotted, this dotted line here, this fine dotted line here, this is the, the, the traditional first and then learned in the embodied simulation. And so you can see they, you know, they kind of sputter a little bit here. It's when they hit the embodied simulation and go to, uh, from the pre to the post-test that they make a jump. And I think it's interesting to actually see how these lines are sort of parallel with each other. You can almost argue that this, this may sort of be the embodied learning boost, if you want to trademark that name, <laughs> for, uh, for this particular group. But almost more interesting is this, right? It transfers, right? It moves over because I'm using the same <coughs> gestures. The content is completely different, but I'm using these gestures and so it resonates. I'm able to be more productive more quickly within, uh, the, within that, that environment. I want to make sure we leave time for questions. So I'm going to buzz through here. Um, so, um, uh, and I'll, I'll put these on play and then we can just watch them. We've since taken this to a multiplayer space because just having one person interact with the simulation, I think, isn't entirely authentic. If we want to start moving these kinds of simulations into classrooms, we need to come up with um, more collaborative types of environments to do it. So you can see two students here are actually working with the simulation and instead of scale, which was the, uh, the cross-cutting concept in the first simulations, this is looking at rates of change. And so you've got two different situations, two completely different topics. This is climate change. We've got a tree populated, the rate of trees in the environment to the rate of pollution. Here we the prey will be, you know, the rate of environment, and this is the rate of food. And so you've got the two students working on these ends of the simulations, and they're, but they're working together to try to control the quantity here. So here they're trying to control the sheep population. They get a goal, like make their, you know, keep it at 200 sheep for, for 60 seconds. Here they're, you know, keep the, keep the uh, you know, the, the melting of the ice caps down to, you know, a certain level for, for this amount of time. And so they're experimenting with these representations of rates as they're doing it. The, um, the sixth lesson that came out of this is that, you know, we initially thought, oh, it's so important to give them this time. And we built this really sophisticated system, gesture recognition system, so that we could tell, well, what gesture do you want to stand for in increase of, in rates? And so you can see they got pretty creative. This is actually the, um, the group on the, the right. So uh, this student here is doing this for like an increase of rates, and this student is doing like a hand waving thing. And so we let them customize it, right? We let them, you know, pick their own uh, gesture representation. Then in another group, we actually had them just use slope lines, right? Everybody, you know, sort of think of rates in terms of a slope line, and so they just acted that out. Much more prescriptive, much more user generated. What do you think happened? They did about the same. They did about the same. 
which you know I'm, I'm not willing to say means we should just sort of throw out customization completely, but it does kind of suggest that maybe it's not necessarily as important as we initially uh, initially thought. So um, the rest of the slides are about actually going into more informal spaces. I've done a number of work, uh, a bunch of work in, in museums. Designing in museums is easier because you know embodied interaction is expected, but in some ways it's harder because you've got to how you know how hard you try to enforce the learning outcomes. Um, uh, embodied learning shouldn't stop being playful. I know that that's a, a big focus of the the group here, um, and you see that a lot in these informal environments. I'm really lucky to be on a number of really cool projects where we are trying to keep it playful. Um, this is a project actually specifically for preschool learners. And then um, uh, finding embodied metaphors that are relevant to student lives. This was actually just going to be a, an excuse for me to talk about the sabbatical that I came back from. I was in Namibia for six months earlier this year. Awesome experience, um, and and really got me thinking hard about you know especially when you're in these environments where there is I mean there's really no you know technology resources to speak of. I mean it's still very much chalkboard and uh, chalk kinds of environments. What opportunities are there still for embodiment? And you know it's you know what I noticed is that whenever they weren't in these seats, they were moving around. Um, There's lots of storytelling. There were lots of um, uh, uh, you know examples that the teacher would use. And you no, know, I remember one of the teachers was talking about you know uh, chemistry, the difference between a solution um, uh, and a um, and a compound by um, by talking about stirring a stew, which you could just sort of feel in the room was something that everybody um, in in the the town that I was in. Um, uh, had some connection to that they could bring sort of personal experience. So kind of getting at the funds of knowledge um, uh, kinds of uh, kinds of ideas there. So I've summarized the nine ideas. I know I ran through the last uh, few of them really quickly. Um, hopefully we can you know continue to engage with these ideas uh, throughout the day. But uh, but thank you. This was a lot of fun. I'm very energized about this stuff. I hope you can tell. Um, uh, and and good to talk to you all. I gave you two minutes. <laughs> so, do we have any questions? Uh, yeah. Uh, while I'm listening to your lecture, I try to differentiate between the simulation and the simulation. I, I think the, the action is a, a key point, but from the learner's perspective, if I do some simulation without action, do I have the same result? Well, do you have any special benefit of action in the simulation? So if you if you actually, I'm trying to, to unpack the question. So you're you're wondering if the student thinks, oh, I'm doing I'm doing things, I'm doing things. so. So from their perspective, are they learning as much as the student is waving the body around? So the simulation has an effect, and yeah. you also include the embedded embodied. So what's the key uh, benefit of embodying in this simulation? Oh yes. So you're wondering if is um, uh, if if it's a simulation that isn't embodied versus one that is. Yeah. So I've done that study, and and I can I can just show you papers. Um, uh, yes, there is a benefit just of actually acting out these um, uh, these scenarios. And I think part of the reason, you know, when you see somebody using like just a desktop simulation, so we, we basically created the same simulation, made an embodied version of it versus a non-embodied version of it. You know, in the non-embodied version of it, there's, you know what, what's missing is exactly what was talking about at the beginning is that, that reflection. You know, they treat it almost like my son treats video games, where it's just trial and error, trial and error, trial and error, trial and error. They're not thinking about it. But when you commit your body, when you have to like walk from one end of the room to the other to sort of act out this idea, there's much more commitment there, there's much more time for reflection um, about those things. You know, you, you put more thought before you do, you know, a, a trial. So I think I think that there there is a big difference and the uh, and the empirical evidence suggests that, that it, there is a benefit of doing those things. Now there's trade-offs, obviously, time, expense, things like that. But um, but I think those things can be can be mitigated in in uh, in critical ways. I'll take one. We have time for one more. Yeah. 
I'm curious, like listening to your talk, that it seemed like a lot of the examples you were using was kind of like students working one on one with the technology or the gestures. Um, I was curious if you've done any work with like group, uh, a group of students using gestures, and whether or not you found that like changed the meaning of how they were understanding certain gestures or movements. Yeah, great question, and, and unfortunately it was mostly just not being able to get to it. So I started at the end with showing that we had the sort of the two-player thing. The grasp simulations that we've created, we're taking into the classrooms, and we're, we're putting students in groups, usually of about three, and having them work in those groups. Um, and it's interesting to see how they sort of build off of each other. You know, one person will, will make an attempt at a gesture, it proves to be productive, and then the other students, even without the technology, are suddenly making uh, making those gestures. So you definitely see, you know, everything that you'd sort of expect to see based on the literature, that there's that nice uptake of, uh, of those ideas. I think the important thing in this case is that, you know, I'm, I'm not sure what happened without it being seeded initially by those technology interactions. You know, students, you know, I've found, you know, especially in classrooms, are very reluctant to sort of use their hands in expressive ways. They don't see that because, you know, school is sort of like, you know, taught us that, like, you know, school is about what you can say and what you can write. It's not about what you can show with your hands. And so there's always a lot of reluctance to sort of use their hands. But once you once you get a technology that is saying, use your hands, like show show me. And, and, and we put a lot into that sort of show me cue. Like just permission to be able to be embodied is a huge factor, I think, in, in a lot of these things. And I think especially with larger groups of, of, of students, that becomes kind of contagious and, and contagious in, in, a, in a really good way. And so yeah, so in the grass project, you know, you can see we're trying to do more of that in the uh, elastic space too, and then certainly in the informal environments where I mean you just don't have any any real control over like you know who's steering and who's not, and it's been really fascinating to see. I mean that's one of the reasons why it's so important for the technology to develop along with our research ideas here. Like we need, I mean the connect is great, but we need we need systems that can actually you know do a little bit more in terms of making the inferences about who's in control, who's you know who's doing what, and and perhaps even doing some orchestration of, of those kinds of activities. So there's yeah there's tons of I think really good possibilities um, in that direction. I'm starting to move there, but uh, but I need I need this guy to help push me through. <laughs> thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you again, Rob. For and pizza on the balcony. So please join us. Woo.